My name is Melanie O'Brien, and I'm the curator here at the Power Plant. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the International Lecture Series um, and the presentation tonight by Inigo Manglano Ovalle, whose exhibition Phantom Truck and Always After is on view at the Power Plant until this Sunday. And the show closes after Sunday. Um, so I am here to introduce Inigo, um, who was born in Madrid. Uh, and lives and works in Chicago. His sculptural um, installation, I should say installation, um, sculpture and video works have explored such phenomenon as war on terror, migration, and climate change. He also was included in Universal Code, Art and Cosmology in the Information Age here at the Power Plant um, a couple of years ago. So I'd just like to thank um, a couple of people. The Power Plant is indebted to our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council, and our partners at Harborfront Centre. Our public programs are supported by our primary education sponsor, CIBC Wood Gundy. And so I'd like to just um, reiterate that Inigo will take uh, questions after his talk, but I'd like you to wait for the microphone if you would. Um, and then we will welcome Inigo. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I can't see anybody. Uh, so come on up. Thanks, Melanie. Oh, it is bright. Can we come down just a little bit? Hi. There. Oh, good. Um, so thanks, Melanie, and I'd like to also thank um, the power plant um, um, for bringing Phantom Truck to uh, North America, right, uh, to Canada, and, um, and Gregory Burke for curating the show and working with me to figure out what two pieces should go together, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So um, the pairing of these two pieces, and maybe my talk will help me do that you know, or maybe help you do that. Um, so, but I'd like to start, I'm, I'm gonna start uh, uh, the presentation today with a, a short film and uh, hopefully end it with another short film um, and, um, and then take questions from you. So I'm not going to introduce this film other than say it's uh, six minutes long. I always like to know how long things are that are being imposed on me, especially when they're conceptual <clears throat> films or videos. So there's six minutes, and then there's a lot of minutes of me talking with other images. So um, why don't we go ahead and, and, and start?
So um, let's see. Uh, let's see if we can join forces together for for this talk. And let's see. There we go. Um, this is a, um, a piece, actually, um, by Robert Berry called "It Has Order," and it originally started as uh, four uh, blank pages with uh, uh, about eight, eight sentences um, uh, written or scrawled on them back in 1969. Um, it reads, uh, it has order, it is always changing, it is affected by other things, it affects other things, it is not confined, it is not in any specific place, it can be presented but go unnoticed, to know of it or to be part of it. And that's how that piece ends. And it could be thought of, um, the subject of what he's talking about could be almost anything. I mean, could be anything from the weather to uh, a larger understanding of climate in its political or social sense. It could be about uh, art or it could be specifically about his art. And I'm just throwing up a slide here of a Robert Berry piece, uh, also from 1969. This is from his Inert Gas series. And uh, it is a photograph that documents the performance or release, rather, of um, a number of cubic feet of helium, in this case, out in the southwestern Mojave Desert. And this is an image that I saw very early on in my career and read about or was told about. And it's an image that has stuck with me throughout, throughout my career as I look at a kind of a landscape that has uh, all of the information and very little information. And where I consider the artist's gesture, uh, the documentation of that gesture, where the art object resides, is there in art object, um, the importance of ephemerality and presence to experience, the politics of the ephemeral, uh, the politics of being present. Um, and, um, and then also where I consider such notions as seeing is believing. Because in this sense, when I looked at the photograph where early on as a young artist, um, I looked at it and I couldn't look at it as a artistic photograph because it was a conceptual document. It was kind of almost like second tier art form just to document a piece. Um, and, um, and then I had to sort of take in the notion of the event that is unseen to me but is documented. And then I had to take in the notion that perhaps Robert Berry was just fooling me or fooling us, that maybe perhaps he was lying and maybe perhaps it never happened. Um, and then taking that on, still sort of embracing the work that with that sort of possibility of a fabricated sort of performance or a fabricated event that I could still sort of embrace uh, the event. And so now I go to um, an early work um, called Sonambulo 2 Blue, which is a, basically a very simple light and sound installation of blue tinted windows and uh, the sculptural elements in the room are always just the speakers themselves or audio systems. Here's an installation uh, at the Art Institute of Chicago that commissioned the piece. The piece actually started out in my first sort of entry into um, uh, one of my first entries into notions of, of climate and climate as a kind of um, a metaphor for our condition, social, cultural, and political. And the piece actually started out as simply uh, a dare. It didn't start out as art. It started out as um, a dare uh, from my wife who, during a long period of chronic insomnia, had uh, threatened me with buying me one of those new age digital devices that plays bubbling brooks or waves coming into the sea or birds and whatnot. And at that time, I had been doing a lot of work on the streets of Chicago, creating work with young men and women on very, very real uh, sort of experiences uh, and, uh, and events. And uh, maybe perhaps 
thinking back, a kind of sort of like high-minded position I took against this kind of new age device that would help me fall asleep, uh, was uh, that I didn't want to involve myself in sort of an artificial uh, environment or jump into a new age industry that I was thinking was maybe perhaps only uh, a symptom of our current uh, social denial or uh, escapism. Uh, so my insomnia continued uh, and uh, now I was now finding myself moved to the couch. And uh, I made a compromise with my wife that if I could make my own New Age sound tape, that uh, I, I would try it out. So, um, so I went to a, an event that had happened while I was working on the west side of Chicago with uh, young men and women shooting videotape and interviewing, which was a drive-by, a drive-by that happened very close by, if not within 100, within 100 feet. Uh, and went back to that original sort of tape, videotape. I was a high eight videotape, so it was analog, and just found that one minute, that one millisecond of the drive by, which was a gunshot, and took that. And back then in 1997, had to work with uh, mathematicians at uh, University of Illinois uh, at Chicago and sound engineers to create now, which is really simple to create, which is a kind of random events, sort of. Uh, using fractal equations and whatnot. But then we had to actually create a mathematical equations that would turn this gunshot into a summer rainstorm that suddenly approached and uh, released thunder and lightning and took about 11 minutes to recede, ending in single droplets of sound. So one bullet kind of replicated itself about 385,000 times, and we needed that math equation to make sure that the raindrops weren't falling in any sort of rhythm, right? So they were falling some random arbitrary moment, right? So I, um, I took that CD that I had Manny uh, um, created with the help of two individuals and um, put it into a Sony Walkman and set it at my bedside and uh, turn it, turned it on. And the first thing you hear in the recording is the real gunshot. And then that gunshot immediately morphs into huge bursts of thunder and it continues to roll and it takes 11 minutes to start retreating. It's kind of creating this environment of this summer rainstorm. It's just kind of moving away in the distance um, quietly. And I think it worked because I think I fell asleep. But what I didn't realize was that I had the Sony Walkman on auto replay. So after 11 minutes, the gunshot went off again, and, and I was awake. So what do you do with something that fails in real life? You make art out of it. And hence, then I made Sonambulo 2 Blue, which was an installation that would take that piece and create an environment uh, where you would enter into that sound environment and that light environment. And of course, you could enter at any moment. Uh, you might enter at the very end of the sound piece and not even recognize because you would have no context for the raindrops or these artificial raindrops. So you would hear a kind of white noise, even if you would hear the white noise. Um, and, um, uh, or you, and then suddenly you'd be in the room and a, a gunshot would ricochet from one end of the room to the other end of the room, startling you or whatever. Or you could come in while the storm was actually brewing and it would be recognizable, okay? So uh, hopefully one would reside in that space long enough to, to not only have the effect of that sound environment, but then to start to realize that something else was happening, right? That, that something on their body, just a shift in color. This blue that you see here is us looking uh, it, from the outside uh, into the room, so it's really dramatic. But when you're in the room, the blue is actually, is kind of very, very neutral, right? And so it only begins to affect you after you're there for a while. And it starts, and you might begin to actually notice it on your partner's face or arms uh, before you even notice it on yourself. 
around that time, um, I was uh, uh, also interested in, uh, in issues of the border and migration, and uh, sp uh, spent some time scouting in Nogales, Arizona, on the border uh, between Nogales, Arizona, and the U.S. and Nogales, Mexico, and uh, sort of just pointing the camera up to the sky to scout for a film that would become a video of clouds crossing across the border without permission. And that video became something called wind shear because when we finally got the real film equipment out there and started to do a time-lapse video, uh, what was actually happening is that we were seeing these puffy white clouds, very sweet clouds, moving at the same time, simultaneously south and north across the border because we had caught a wind shear event, which is uh, usually kind of uh, uh, announcing uh, some other climatic event that will soon follow, or some other event, you know, plane crash, tornadoes, uh, thunderstorms. You know. The filmmaking ended because it did happen and it unleashed itself on top of us. Um, but I only took a portion of that video that was these beautiful little puffy innocent clouds going from the U.S. to Mexico and from Mexico to the U and just inserted it into a chip so they would always play out in these video monitors um, and so the work would reverse itself digitally and the piece would go on forever. The piece also had its take, it had followed Sonambulo so it had a kind of look of kind of a new AG video and in fact it was first installed uh, in an installation together with that soundtrack that I just spoke about. And that installation was called the El Nino Effect, which converted first uh, San Antonio's uh, art, sp art Pace Foundation into a fully functioning sensory deprivation spa. And then subsequently, as it moved to other institutions or galleries, converted all of those spaces into uh, these spas. When you would walk into the gallery, what you would usually find are these kind of dead or mute white polygonal forms. These kind of these are 1970 designs of uh, sensory deprivation uh, tanks that have just been tweaked uh, with new technology, mostly for hygiene. Um, and but it's kind of a very old design from the 70s, and I chose them because they also reminded me of a kind of Robert Morris notes on sculpture kind of look, but usually when you entered this place, you would have this dead sort of uh, tanks, these twin tanks, and this video in the back, and this sound. If you moved around to the second gallery, there were always two galleries, you would walk into a shower room, and that shower room would most likely have, most of the time, people's clothes hanging on pegs, because 95% of the time that you entered into the space, it was in use. Uh, there was either somebody in the tanks, usually a pair, uh, or they were taking showers, or they were dressing up, or they were coming from the showers to get in the tanks, or they were coming out of the tanks. Okay? Um, so the El Nino effect ran, would usually run for the duration of the show and would have hour and a half free sessions of uh, flotation. The only condition that I asked was that uh, you, wouldn't, you would not do this alone. You would do this with someone someone else. And so usually it was, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, uh, buddy and pal, brother and sister. Um, and But we always had a couple of slots for people who didn't have a partner who then could hook up uh, with somebody else. And again, this is pre sort of Facebook and chat lines, so people would kind of set up and get to know each other, call each other up, feel comfortable about taking showers and getting into the tanks separately but at the same time, right? So these are a series of photographs of the piece. One was called Niña, Niño. This is called Niño and Niño. This one's called Niña and Niño. And this is called Niña and Niña. So the El Niño effect happened around 1977, the first time, which was a, one of the moments uh, in which, um, uh, with uh, cable television, 
that uh, one, one of the last sort of moments where the El Nino effect actually became a cultural event. Um, and what I mean by that is that it moved from the, uh, from the Weather Channel or just a local weatherman reporting on it to CNN, CBC, NBC, Nightly News would usually broadcast an update on the El Nino event. But it usually would either follow or precede another sort of report by the same anchorman which was the 1997 onslaught of undocumented immigrants crossing the border from Tijuana to uh, San Diego uh, pre-steel wall, right? And so for me, it was a kind of real sort of curiosity of watching these two things back to back, right? Because the El Nino effect, or El Nino, was first coined by a Dominican uh, Spanish priest during colonial times for this kind of strange sort of event that usually happened in December, started to affect things in December down in uh, what was, uh, colonial Southern America. Uh, he was actually a uh, missionary in Colombia and, um, and would happen around December, early January. So the El Nino for him meant, he's a Catholic, Christian, so it meant the child. And in that case, came in December, it meant the Christ child, so the coming of the Christ child albeit a very colicky sort of child that kind of unleashed havoc all over the place. And so then the term El Nino effect to me in 1977 had a kind of different reverberation because now it was once again, you know, the El Nino effect sort of is hot water heated in the Pacific Ocean, uh, Southern Pacific Ocean, and then creates climactic sort of uh, uh, events or situations and it moves up north into the northern hemisphere, and we now know that it affects climate all over the world. Um, but the El Nino, when um, Tom Brokaw was first uh, talking about it, um, was, in a sense for me, this other reference, right? Which is now not the Christ child uh, sort of coming forth, but the brown child moving from north to child, south. It's a combination of the Spanish term El Nino and then the Amer English term, the effect, and this a kind of Americanization of uh, the El Nino effect as an event. Um, I returned to San Diego, Tijuana, uh, or to the border rather, to do a piece in 2001, uh, right on the border, now the fence was up. And this is a, a photograph uh, just taken from a helicopter of uh, of that border. <clears throat> so you see on the left hand side you see a actually a really nice uh, park there uh, uh, just north of the of the border. Uh, also a uh, heavily patrolled area. This border is sort of has the largest sort of uh, one of the most highly monitored borders in the world and is equipped with all sorts of technology you name it uh, to sense uh, movement or penetration across the border. And then just south of that, and that is on the right side of the image, is you see Playas de Tijuana, and in the back, back in the horizon, you see Tijuana itself. Playas de Tijuana is kind of a suburb of Tijuana, close to the Pacific Ocean. And abutting uh, the fence, you see La Plaza Monumental de Torros, which is the northernmost uh, bullfight ring in North America. It's a, it's a beautiful 1950s sort of brutalist concrete um, uh, structure. And uh, I was in doing research on what I would do uh, for uh, uh, this exhibition uh, uh, put together by Insight in San Diego and Tijuana and uh, would, was driving around with my friend Marcos Erre, uh, from, who's an artist from Tijuana, and we just went to Playas de Tijuana actually to have um, fish tacos because they had really good fish tacos there. And I pointed to the bullfight ring from the outside and I said, this thing is great. I should make a UFO out of it, right? And it was a joke, and, but that joke stuck with me. I returned to Chicago and uh, two weeks later I called up Marco and I said, Marco, I think I'm going to make the UFO. Uh, in the end, the piece uh, was called Search or Embuscadad, and what it did was to convert the bullfight ring into a pirate radio station 
and a low-tech but albeit fully functional uh, radio telescope that pointed to the skies. So the bullfight ring is um, sort of uh, cleaned up a little bit. All the sort of like international pendants are removed, white pendants are installed. Uh, most of the Corona and Tecate advertisements are whited out. Um, and a parabolic uh, dish is set above the Tauromachia or the sand pit, the bullfighting sand uh, arena. And above it is suspended uh, an antenna. And there you see the antenna. And here you see one of the entrances with the name of a very famous um, bullfighter. Those were the only things that weren't blotted out. And then from this vantage point, you can actually see from across the stadium through that entrance, and you can see San Diego off in the north. So um, search uh, or en busqueda had a colon title, which was the search uh, in, uh, in search for the real aliens. So we basically set up a, uh, a radio telescope that sought very much like SETI to communicate with extraterrestrials. So for three months, the piece uh, functioned and listened. And for three months, it sent its signal out on a pirate radio station. And the pirate radio station uh, used a transmitter that oscillated from the low end of the FM spectrum all the way up to the top and then turned around and oscillated back and just moved across ever so slightly um, uh, or s slow, slowly. Um, so it would interrupt any other FM radio station, but it would interrupt it only momentarily and hardly even perceptibly. So the art going public would search for the search on the radio because they knew what the piece was about and would most likely never find, find search. Um, they would probably think they found it, but it might be just static between stations and so forth. Um, uh, on the other hand, after about two and a half months, very close to the end of uh, the, the duration of the piece, uh, taxi drivers in, San Diego, in Tijuana started talking to each other about things that were happening on their local broadcast stations, the ones they would listen to all the time, whether it was a sports station, news station, or music station. These just blips of missing or new sound that would happen um, uh, every once in a while and almost on a kind of regular basis, but with a, enough duration between them that you might not even ever notice them. Um, and they started talking, and then they started talking at coffee shops, and then soon uh, a journalist from Tijuana had put out a story that taxi drivers had been receiving signals from extraterrestrials. This is a piece of uh, a photograph of search during twilight. Uh, there was a technical problem. Uh, uh, there's always technical problems in my work, and I try to f then rewire them into the piece, which was a feedback from uh, the antenna and our low-tech parabolic dish made by sail-making engineers and architects down in San Diego and, and Tijuana. And that is that we were getting feedback between them and we had to filter it out to send out a kind of very clean, staticky, white noise signal on the pirate radio station. But instead of dumping that sort of signal through filters, we just took it and put it, and put it into another situation which is with a set of amplifiers and about 50 subwoofers underneath the parabolic turn, uh, tent made the whole um, uh, plaza, the whole bullfight ring, start to hum like a subwoofer. So when you came to visit the piece, you were handed these noise reducers and you would basically enter into the place and you would actually hear the piece through your solar plexus. So it kind of followed a series of work that I had been doing, uh, which was to sort of provide these services. In this case, uh, a kind of a sonic, uh, sonic, uh, thora uh, what do you call it? Yeah, sonic thorax massage, which actually exists out there 
in therapeutic spas, sound, waves, massaging your internal organs if you're into that. Um, this piece followed uh, soon after and is called uh, Fe Sad Light. And in its first derivation in uh, San Francisco in February during their gloomy winters, much like your winters here, um, Sad Light was a, a sculpture that consisted there of uh, white Mies van der Rohe daybeds and a series of fluorescent tubes full spectrum tubes that would function as a therapy room for seasonal affected disorder. And in this case, you were again invited to participate. This time you could stay as long as you want and uh, you would be doused uh, with this uh, light. You would sit on these couches, you, you and your partner, and you were given uh, these kind of tanning goggles, uh, not to protect your eyes, but maybe perhaps just to make you feel comfortable as the rest of the museum goers kind of pranced around you while you laid during your session. Uh, this image is the, a derivation of that in uh, Helsinki, uh, Finland, also in the middle of their sort of almost sunless winter, and in this case using um, Alvar Alto daybeds uh, as as therapy salons. In San Francisco, the piece was directly connected to SETI. So what you heard as a white noise that kind of buffered out the rest of the museum was actually a direct link to SETI in Berkeley. And uh, that white static noise was SETI listening for extraterrestrial life or communication. So maybe I'll just show one more of these. Uh, and, and this one uh, has a rather long title. Again, it's a free public service uh, spa, and this one is a deep uh, synchronized deep facial shiatsu massage. And this was installed in a um, big art fair in Madrid called Arco, a fair much the size of uh, Basel's art fair or the armory in New York. Um, and uh, it provided um, deep facial massages to art goers that would sign up for 15 minute sessions. Um, the piece again was totally twinned out and I had done scouting for uh, the um, uh, masseuse and um, had looked for identical twins. Okay. So I had scouted in Madrid months prior and sort of wrote off every, all those Wrigley chewing gum looking like twins. And these guys came in and uh, they turned out to be uh, Jorge and Raul Rodriguez, who were perfect for the piece because they were good looking guys. They were not Nordic looking guys. They were just really good, good looking guys. But on top of it, they were both lead singers and guitar players in their band called Turbo Lovers. So I knew that they were performers and that they had good hands, right? So they spent about two months training uh, to do the facial massage and ended up during the event doing synchronized massage. So they would start on one, they would both start at the same time. And I think they got it down perfectly. And uh, you would watch them, and they would be making almost identical moves. I'm not going to talk about the video in the back, because I'll spend too much time on this piece. So after a series of interventions into white cubes with uh, this type of work, I was invited to, do, uh, to work with Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House at Plano, Illinois. And usually they invite artists to do work out there. But most of the artists are photographers and filmmakers. So in the end, they get these beautiful films and beautiful photographs of the work. And my expectation was that I could intervene in there. I soon found out on my first visit that I had to not only don on surgical booties, but I couldn't touch anything. There was one thing I could touch inside, which was a doorknob to the only bathroom that you could use while you were visiting the space. And otherwise, the space was to be left untouched. And so that basically canceled out the whole sort of interventionist project until it dawned on me that someone had to wash the windows. 
and I got in touch with the window washer, and we made a deal that he would become my technical advisor for a film, and I would become his assistant window washer. So after 20 minutes of training, which was not enough, uh, he uh, sat off to the side while we filmed the performance, which was myself just washing the, the front window of this building while inside an actor is uh, spinning uh, some music. Um, and this converted itself into a loop. Um, so, um, and this loop, um, in a sense, has the artist or slash window washer washing the window over and over and over again. The piece is called Le Bazaire or The Kiss uh, for a number of reasons because in a way it's an homage, it's a caress of the building, um, but it's also the kiss because I'm not a good window washer. So uh, the flaw is heard on a non-professional window washer when you hear that little squeegee sound, that little kind of obnoxious sort of Hollywood kiss on a pane of glass while you're doing it. And then kiss also because the soundtrack uh, that's being played inside and then subsequently in the film when the camera's inside the building uh, is a one millisecond from a guitar solo by the band Kiss that is then stretched out to become the music soundtrack whenever the camera is inside the building. This is a um, performance at Mies van der Rohe's 868-80 North Lakeshore Drive apartments uh, on a specific climactic day. I had access to one of the more authentic sort of uh, apartments still left in the complex and um, with permission to wait out a particular climactic event, which is a deep fog, but a fog with on a very also bright day. So it's, it's just white opacity. And so it was my chance to have a sensory deprivation sort of um, experience. Uh, and so the piece lasts for the duration of, of that event. And I have a photographer who is not allowed to talk to me and only sort of record, record the event. This piece is called White Noise. Uh, an intervention at the Barcelona Pavilion uh, called White Flags. Very simple, it removes the now, currently, uh, well, this, they're always changing the flags here. I guess that's part of the piece. Um, so I think currently it's the Catalonian flag and the European Union flag that hangs up there. Originally, it would have been uh, the, the German flag for the 1934, I think, World's Fair. Um, and so those are changed uh, uh, into uh, white flags. Uh, the inside is in, has installed in a, a number of elements. It's a very quiet installation. Two drawings by Mies, or rather by me, of Mies's drawings for the 1938 Brussels Pavilion uh, that he didn't get selected for uh, under the Third Reich. The drawings that were kind of sort of copies or forgeries of his drawings copies, I would say, of appropriations. Drawings of a building that is very similar to the Barcelona Pavilion with flags and with very sort of faint, well, not so faint, uh, swastikas. And then the recreation of a model um, from his sketches of what that Brussels Pavilion would look like in the space and kind of a very sort of white wood. And then simply resting in the fountain, the indoor pool, a white soccer ball without any markings. And then two photographs of a young Moroccan immigrant just holding up a small white flag in front of the Barcelona Pavilion. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. This is a still from Always After the Glass House that's being showed here currently. I think that you've seen this film, right? So uh, it is, um, maybe I'll just say that 
it's not necessary to know where it is shot at, um, although it's shot at Mies van der Rohe's Crown Hall, which is his uh, school of architecture that he designed for IIT in Chicago. And it's the breaking of the windows of that building and then the sweeping of the glass in that building. I can talk more about this piece, I think, in the question and answer session, if I move along at a quicker pace. Um, this is, yeah, this will probably be the last kind of Mesian project that I'll show. This is uh, just came down last uh, October um, at uh, Mass Mocha. And um, it was the uh, building of a, a theoretical project by Mies. He had a house called the House with Four Columns. Uh, that it's also called a 50 by 50 because it's supposed to be 50 feet by 50 feet square plan. Um, and that was never built. Um, a lot of a lot of it was due to engineering problems of how to support the ceiling structure uh, and keep the building from torquing. Uh, with just these four columns on the sides. But Myron Goldsmith, his engineer, said the only reason it never got built because it was a proposal for a glass house for a family of four, which was totally inane. And as a theoretical conjecture, uh, a glass house with no walls. So I built it in a 25 by 25 footprint. So now it's kind of a glass house for a bachelor, let's say. And then uh, turned it upside down. And uh, it's presented with the door just cracked open a little bit. And every once in a while, you and then everything's kind of suspended in the ceiling except for one thing. And then every once in a while, you hear phone ringing inside the building. So here you can get a notion of uh, the, the architecture and the furnishings and uh, this glass table. and. Uh, the only thing that has fallen is a coffee cup that has fallen from the glass table and broken and shattered and spilled on this sort of pristine white ceiling. And then what rings is this iPhone that rings and leaves messages. About 25 messages it leaves and takes about 60 minutes for the whole cycle to go through. And so in this piece, which is called Gravity of the Forces to be Reckoned With, the whole project um, was actually started out when I began working on Always After the Glass House. Because Always After the Glass House, it of course in the parenthetical glass house refers to a kind of modernist a sort of a notion, right, of the transparent sort of building or house. It calls forth things like Farnsworth House or Philip Johnson's Glass House and so forth. But it also refers to a film that was never uh, produced um, by Sergei Eisenstein called The Glass House, which was based on a novel by uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin in 1921 called We, which is the first, some say, the first sci-fi novel. Um, and so I take Zamyatin's novel and with some cursory notes left by Sergei Eisenstein, try to finish up the screenplay for Sergei Eisenstein's The Glass House and propose shooting the film at Mass Mocha, which becomes kind of an impossible sort of project and out of which becomes this project, Gravity's a Force to be Reckoned With. And the screenplay is now becomes a series of these 25 phone calls of three characters calling the protagonist from the novel or the artist or Sergei Eisenheim or Mies van der Rohe uh, or you and plays out this kind of narrative uh, of uh, video, video calls. This is a film still from a piece, so now kind of leaving Mies for a while and jumping radically into the jungle with uh, Oppenheimer. This is a film still 
for a film called Oppenheimer. Um, and uh, this film was uh, shot or created, the piece was created in uh, 2003. Uh, 2003 is a moment in which I was searching for a modern day Virgil that would guide us or guide me through the current sort of political climate uh, of our uh, inferno and still our ongoing inferno. And after much thinking, I came across and I thought that Robert Oppenheimer would be uh, the perfect Virgil for our, uh, for our age. And I wanted to set him in kind of, uh, in purgatory, actually. I wanted to move to the next, uh, or to another of the Dantean uh, uh, tr trilogies. And so what you see is a film of a, a camera that circles in this jungle around this figure that is standing on the surface of the water uh, that has a cigarette that is always burning but never burning down and the camera approaches him from various angles. Um, again, it's one of these endurance pieces, so you're locked in this jungle with Robert Oppenheimer. <clears throat> it was shot about six blocks away from my house in Chicago at uh, Jen Jensen's uh, 1906 Fern Room, or Conservatory Fern Room, which uh, is exactly what it is, a room of ferns. And uh, <clears throat> so you see here the skylight, and you see like my assistant there in the corner waiting on uh, my actor, uh, Roger Duffy, who I had met in uh, New York uh, when I was invited to be one of the artists on his design team for the World Trade Center uh, competition that was subsequently won by Danny Liebeskind. Anyway, Roger came to me in my studio when we were doing... Uh, casting calls or searching out for uh, Robert Oppenheimer to meet with me because our team of architects and artists were falling apart and he wanted to come to Chicago to talk to me to see if we could figure out how to keep the team together. And my assistant, who you see there, Cindy, kept kicking me under the table while Roger was explaining the situation until I realized that she was kicking me and nodding her head over to Roger and suddenly I realized that Roger was Opie that he was uh, Robert Oppenheimer, okay? And so he subsequently came to Chicago, and in this shot, he's donning a pair of, what do you call them, waiters, and they sunken into the plan. And this is a photograph um, around that time, not a photograph taken by me, and not used by me, of uh, Afghan soldiers in a poppy field. And this is a photograph of a poppy, not taken by me, but requested by me um, via Reuters and AP Photographer Bank for someone to photograph a poppy in Afghanistan using night vision. And so this is this image that then is sent to me digitally in a low-res JPEG and then created into a work called uh, Night Vision uh, White Poppy. Uh, and it's the precursor to a piece uh, commissioned by uh, MoMA uh, for a show called Tempo. Uh, and this piece would involve using military night vision and uh, to have a kind of live projection. And of course I had to test that instrument out, so I used my five-month-old son and uh, in his dark room and filmed him using this night vision camera. Uh, to, to test it. Subsequently, this tape becomes then a work of art many years later. Uh, and if you, and since you know night vision from the news, you know it's highly pixelated. So the image always almost looks like the child is not moving, and the only thing that moves seems to be the pixels until every once in a while the child kind of lifts, or my, my son kind of takes a deep breath and you see the stripes on his chest kind of move. Uh, so this piece that was a test later on became a piece called Sonambulo, which in Spanish means sleepwalker. Um, uh, Sonambulo, infrared, even though this is not infrared. It's night vision. Okay. 
but it was used to test out this installation called Nocturne at MoMA. When you enter a dark room, I create these situations like the truck, I enter the room sealed dark, and all you see is this large projection of these flowers that are fluttering in the wind, and then you hear all this static that's happening. Uh, and then, again, as in Phantom Truck, when your eyes adjust, you start to see that there's something else in the room with you, and it's um, this sculptural sort of event right, of these artificial poppies that are braced into position uh, to be monitored by a series of cameras, and also these little Radio Shack computer fans that blow onto the poppies and assure that they will flutter for the camera. The soundtrack is a shortwave uh, radio that searches for communication from Central Asia on shortwave bands. And of course, since the museum is open from 11 to 6 during the daytime, if you're a ham radio operator, I am not, or I was for quite a while for this installation, or for gathering soundtracks for other pieces. Uh, you know that in listening on shortwave radio during the day is, uh, is ludicrous because you won't receive any uh, bandwidth during daylight hours. Uh, so triggered into the piece is this listening for communication and this failure of receiving anything. And this becomes a kind of live sound broadcast while you're getting a live image of the poppies. Okay, And this is the piece when I started to think about image and vision on, in its political sort of uh, ramifications. Because for the piece to work in the total darkness of the room, night vision, unlike infrared technology, which needs a heat source, night vision needs at least some light. So if you're in the desert of Iraq, night vision doesn't work unless there's a clear night and you have at least some starlight. Okay, so. The piece doesn't function unless we give some light. And so usually what the MoMA guard would have to come in is you come in and uh, take a big lighter out and he kind of flick it just for a second and that would give a little burst of light. The camera would begin just to see the flowers, send that image to the projector. The projector would then project that image, that faint image. That faint image would now start lighting the flowers. And then as the flowers are being lit, the whole thing starts to light itself up and then achieve sort of this balance and hold itself, right? So it started this sort of symbiotic connection between the image of the thing, right, and then the object itself and which one becomes visible first or which one exists. And it started into questions of notions or started to raise questions, or at least just for myself, I wanted to raise questions if indeed there are things that are imaged before they come into existence. And how does that work in terms of issues of both politics and specifically the politics of war, right? So what exists first before reality? So this is a still of Joggernaut, which is the film that I've Voice it on you at the very beginning. This is when the truck finally leaves. And it was shot on the other side of those hills. Okay. This is uh, San Ignacio, Laguna San Ignacio, in Baja, California, the midpoint of Baja, California. Um, um, it is uh, this lagoon touches one of the largest biosphere preserves called the El Vizcaino Biosphere Preserve, which is a sanctuary of two lagoons for great whale mating and birthing, as well as for sea turtles, pronghorn antelopes, all sorts of uh, endangered fauna and uh, flora. And then abutting the lagoon on the north side is Guerrero Negro, one of the ugliest towns in Mexico. And I love Mexico, and they have beautiful towns, but Guerrero Negro is basically an um, industrial town that services only one thing, which is the world's largest industrial salt works owned by Mitsubishi. 
uh, which is where the film that you saw was shot in one of the last holding tanks of salt. And what you see here are mountains of piled up salt that have been harvested by Mitsubishi, ready to go off to mostly Asia and Japan. Uh, Two percent for table salt and the rest of it for really highly toxic chemicals, many of them that we use if we bleach stuff or use cleaners. This is an image of <clears throat> part of the salt work complex. And that's an image of the truck that you would have seen in the film. Here, of course, the truck only has three wagons. I gave you, I think, 12. Just doing some sound recording. I was invited uh, by uh, Berkeley Museum and Museum of San Diego, Contemporary Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, uh, as part of a ten, 10 artists who were sent to all these natural preserves, World Heritage Natural Sites to do work, uh, to do work on the El Vizcaino Bio Preserve. And I decided to turn my camera away from nature and onto culture, away from this notion of trying to preserve the natural state and to look at this kind of artificially or culturally constructed uh, landscape. And I told them I would use on uh, my trips, I said, I will come back and I will make a work with no whale sounds, absolutely no whale sounds, which is not true because what, a lot of what you heard in that video is whale sounds. So, <clears throat> and the piece is called Joggernaut. And this is uh, a, a 19th century etching of a, a three-wheel, a four-wheeled cart that carries the uh, image or the uh, statue of the god Jagannatha uh, in India. Um, as part of the Vedic festivals, the god is taken out and moved uh, from the temple, paraded through the city, and then brought back. Um, the colonial English uh, missionaries first saw this event and came back with reports of worshipers throwing themselves underneath the wheels of the um, vehicle, uh, willingly uh, um, uh, killing themselves for their god Jagannatha, which they could not pronounce, so it became Jagannatha and hence the term unstoppable uh, force or institution. This is one of those events contemporaneously. And so the film is uh, a one take uh, shot with a simple dolly uh, that first moves across the horizon as this large salt harvester uh, catches up to it and then passes it. And this is one version of an installation using three channels. And this is my take on that Robert Berry photograph. Right? This is now a, uh, a salt flat in, in the salt works, one that has been abandoned, so it's kind of almost becoming a kind of a natural landscape, and some whale vertebrae in the picture, which were actually um, brought in from the only restaurant and hotel in Guerrero Negro while the film crew and I were staying there. So I kind of just took them and then set them up for you. This is a piece called uh, Dirty Bomb, in many ways self-explanatory. Uh, it's. Uh, 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 in size and dimensions and proportions. It's the exact uh, replica of uh, Fat Man that dropped on Nagasaki in 1945, although it has been kind of reduced and slicked out in kind of a very sort of pristine white uh, car enamel. Uh, it's installed and uh, previous to the opening of the exhibitions, it is dirtied up uh, with mud being tossed on it. And I, I can, I'm going to try to get through this talk, so I'm going to, maybe I can talk more about this piece later on if there are any questions. So 
So just briefly with Phantom Truck, Phantom Truck, very much like the El Nino effect, started while I was watching these reports of both the El Nino effect and immigration uh, in 1997. And so I'm watching this thing live and I'm listening and taking it in. And I think by the end of the speech, watching it, I knew more or less what I was going to do at some point uh, with it. So here's another image. Right. I'm really interested in these images because I know that this was a very sort of important speech. In fact, it was the rationale that pushed the U.S. into that invasion, not pushed in which they kind of, I often think of Colin Powell's speech as the Trojan horse, right? Uh, it was the thing that allowed right, the Greeks to enter Troy. So uh, the speech itself uh, as an event becomes the sculpture. And so the truck for me is actually a portrait less of the truck uh, than of the speech itself. So I kind of reverse the things, at least for my own mind. Uh, but what I was really interested in is knowing uh, and we knew that he was going to talk to the UN Security Council, so we sat to listen to this live, uh, some of us, um, and or watched it later on, and watched the whole thing kind of unfold. And one of the things that was interesting to me is that given all the sophistication of the NSA and the CIA and the State Department, that the pictures of these trucks were these, that these were like kind of cartoons, that little... Tonka toys, right? And uh, this is when I started to get interested in this notion of low resolution, but not low resolution like in night vision, which is another form of low resolution, uh, but low resolution as a kind of political sort of image and a political sort of strategy. That is this whole idea that maybe perhaps that High definition is something that we expect in entertainment and Hollywood provides. And we know that when we come in and watch Avatar, we know we are being fooled. But we enjoy just the experience of that ultra high reality of high definition, right? So, and we're conscious of that. We sort of, there's an unwritten contract between the makers or the fabricators of that, that kind of imagery and us, the receptors of it. Well, it became kind of interesting to me when I thought about the speech that maybe perhaps the tables are turned and it's actually was very intentional that these were low resolution cartoon images because sometimes it's the obfuscated sort of more opaque, more distant sort of information that actually makes us think that maybe it's possible, right? So for example, uh, reports on UFOs above Mexico City never come to you in high definition, right? It's always the blurry photograph or the shaky video, and that's the one that works. And so I was really interested in how, during this speech, this notion of the low-res image was being used. So then, subsequently to in, uh, invading Iraq, uh, maybe a month, maybe only three and a half weeks later, uh, this image appeared in the New York Times and probably in papers across Canada as well. Uh, and it was released by the, the State Department. They had found the truck, right? And so now we get the high res image of the truck, right? The real, the truck. And, uh, and within days, they send their experts out there. Uh, within 48 hours, their experts determine that it is not capable of producing uh, biological weapons, that maybe perhaps it will produce hydrogen for weather balloons from water. Okay. But uh, I use that image and a series of images from white papers from the State Department. <clears throat> Here's a series of just collaged photographs in order to sort of get an idea of how I'm going to sort of make and build this truck. Right. And then it's all proposed for documenta. And it would hide in this building. Okay. Castle, interesting, Castle is, was, uh, I mean, the whole reason for documenta 
was that it was trying to sort of recover itself as a city, right? So it was post-war, and I think it was 1955, the first documenta, I think, right? So it was a real effort to take this city that had been kind of bombed out and devastated, mostly because it held this Mercedes plant and a couple of other plants that cranked out trucks and tanks, right? So wrapped into that was the, the kind of the spirit of first presenting phantom truck in a city of these kind of military sort of uh, uh, vehicles and then chose this one building next to Documenta Halla that from the outside is impenetrable. It's kind of like a bunker and situated the truck there for the first time. In that space, unlike this space, there is no red lights in the room. There's a small skylight that lets in just a little minimum amount of light. And of course, there your eyes adjust. And they never, never, ever, as you've experienced here, adjust to this extent. So you never see the truck completely like this. Next to that room is another room, uh, the radio, uh, which is an installation also by me, that allows in a sliver of red light. Of course, this again is another camera taking a long exposure, so now we see the truck in this kind of red field that your eyes would never see. Okay. And the truck is a very reductive sort of form itself. So it's kind of this, uh, it's between the low res, Colin Powell's low rest slide and the actual photograph of the false trucks and it kind of mix them, mixes them into this kind of very reductive thing. So two things I was going for was kind of a very sort of minimalist sort of approach to making sculpture and to uh, a kind of uh, feeling to a physical object that we get from a lot of video game architecture or architectural 3D modeling. So it's kind of a virtual truck. So in the end, it's a fabrication of the fabrication. So it's reduced in one sense. Uh, and then also, I have to begin to think about how I'm going to actually, what makes the components. So uh, I just go back to that sort of like old art convention of using the golden ratio. So most of the rectangles here are all based on golden ratios, except for that tool box that's sitting underneath the, the truck which is an exact copy of a Donald Judd piece that's a favorite of mine. So that has now substituted itself under, under the truck. None of this information is important, really. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not really important that you know I'm referring to Colin Powell's non-existent truck. Um, I'll talk about that later, maybe perhaps in questions and answers. Most important is your sort of experience with the truck itself. How are we doing on time? Do we got five minutes? Okay, so what, what I want to do um, uh, is uh, to, to show a, 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 f a film, right? I'm going to put you through now only five minutes.
as in a lot of my pieces, including jogging up, there's also radio transmissions that come in. And then there's a siren that we don't know where it came from. We don't know if it was happening in the salt fields and we didn't notice it, so it came from the siren in the back. Um, and then we threw in some, some other songs. But um, um, like, uh, uh, you know, always after the glass house, that sound is all foam. Right? So that's all I sound. That's glass breaking in the studio, uh, what do you call it? tempered glass, right? And sort of tempered glass breaking and then popping. You didn't realize that if you break tempered glass and just leave it on a cement floor, it keeps popping with popcorn. Um, and so all sorts of kind of uh, tricks with, with the sound. But Leviathan, like always after, started as slowly footage. It's B-roll footage. In fact, uh, this footage was shot uh, while we set up, you know, 300 meters of track to do the real film, right? So we could board, um, you know, the, the, the grips, we don't know what they're doing, to set perfectly level tracks by doing the job, which takes like two hours to set up, so you do a you shoot things, you know, you shoot ospreys, you shoot the horizon, and, uh, and in this case it's a macro lens right on top of it. Uh, right on top of the so, so um, and you know, it was after the glass house, it's also B-roll, because I went there basically to do a documentary. Have you done a documentary and we did a few cameras to do a documentary of this event where Mises' grandson breaks the glass of the building, and we had a B-roll camera. And um, at the end of the event, once it's all over, I sort of work with the director of photography. We switch the camera to high speed and go, okay, let's let's catch this. Let's catch the sweeping of the glass. Let's catch people leaving this. Let's do this. And then all this stuff lays in the can. And ultimately, and always after the glass house, all the Abe roll footage is just thrown out. Useless, no reason to make a documentary. And use B roll footage to make a piece called Always After. And in this case, this is being shot. So while, while I'm shooting this, and I'm only moving about like, that much of space with the camera for the Viking, and I don't even realize that there's a dead insect that's going to come into the field of view. So I do everything I can to not sort of shake the moment that that, that happens. But then that's thrown into people, and then that's recovered very much like the gunshot. So that, oh yeah, the, the gunshot, that's <laughs> being recuperated, and that's recovered. And then it's uh, taken from film and transferred to digital footage, and then it's uh, compressed to actually be able to Edit it because the, the original film uh, um, at high definition is too, the, the imagery is too big for my studio. So we have to compress it to see what we're looking at. And in that compression, something goes wrong with the digital compressor, whatever that program is, right? And so all the color that you see there that you believe is something like artistic move is the computer having a hiccup. It can never be reproduced again. Yeah. So then that's the only way, right? Because it didn't work. And that sits around for two years. And then it's kind of recovered. Right? It's recovered as kind of an homage to Paul Sharp's uh, uh, 60s, 70s conceptual filming. A specific piece called uh, Ray Gun Virus, which is just uh, alternating colors in a film that create this sort of strange phenomenological effect that is projected. So the life then becomes kind of homage to him and So certain things are kind of like they kind of lose <coughs> start to lose track as to what is authentic and what is is fabricated. And a lot of my work kind of tries to do it yeah. yeah, at least even for myself as a producer.
Oh, I'm so loud. I know, Heather, you're here. Hi, Inigo. Um, so it's interesting, like, I would, I would love you to talk a bit about, like, it seems like some of the time you're following the plan you've made. Like you design the truck or whatever, and you're, you're pro I'm thinking about your process, you know, like you're instigating or following an idea. And then at other times, it seems that you're open and rediscovering kind of random things, throw away things, this recovery process. Can you sort of talk about that a little bit just in terms of your working process? I mean, I, I think that that's part of, I mean, hopefully that's part of all sort of part of making, right? And burnout is to sort of, to discover what it, the hell that it is they're doing. Do you just go like snooping through all this weird footage? And, like, do you just go like snooping through this weird footage at times where you're just well, for the truck, I went there to get the truck. That image that you saw, I went to get that. In my mind, I went to get that. In right. fact, even before going down to do my research trip physically, I knew about the salt mine. I had seen pictures. I had seen pictures of that beautiful whale, right? Yeah. And so I said, okay, I'll go down there. And I already knew that I was not going to do anything in the biosphere. I was going to shoot one of these trucks coming across the screen at the salt Right. Of course, I imagine there would be this beautiful white hill behind the truck. But well, where the trucks are picking up the salt, there are no hills the truck, right? So I had to deal with the disappointment at that moment, but I still went after, after that, that piece. But in many ways, like with, uh, always after the glass house, I think uh, that piece, um, at a certain point, you know, I, I do put, with film, with a lot of film, uh, with most of it, I do put it in the can for about a year. I shoot, and then I don't look at it. Uh, so then when I look at it, it's like really fresh, and I think it's kind of material. So in many ways, it's almost like a found object, rather than uh, a kind of fabricated image. So with all this after, I was kind of almost like mining it as a material. And much of my interest in Always After uh, film was that I was already in a lot of other sculptural works dealing with other large uh, natural phenomena, thunderstorms and icebergs and whatnot. So I really got into the film just surely out of this whole idea of a kind of ice flow avalanche of diamonds. You know, and I just kind of wanted to groove on that visually uh, myself, right? Um, so, and, and I always want to, I, I think I always, um, I don't know, I, <clears throat> I think what I always want to do is to create a situation. And I think that I'm very selfish because I want to create a situation that I want to experience for myself. So for example, Phantom Truck, I can't build it in my studio. I can only kind of conceptualize it, produce it. But in order to have that experience, it has to almost like happen for me the first time when I exhibit it. So I want, I work as hard as I can to, to get to that situation to also have uh, that, ex that experience, right? You know? In other pieces, I won't have the experience at all. Like, I've never gone into such a deprivation tank. I could never go into a sensory deprivation tank and be alone just by myself, with no, nothing but my own thoughts and nerves and pulsing heart. I mean, that would be totally freaky. But, you know, at that moment, it was actually about something else, right? I mean, someone else having that kind of experience. And yet, when I first installed that piece, the moment I walked in, I installed it, but the moment I came in the next day, right, uh, after the opening, at the opening, we had, we, I called two of my friends to volunteer to get in the tapes, right? But the next day I came in to see it, and she said, how's it going? I go, I'm going to check the tanks just to see if the water is good, the temperature is good. And go, hey, shh, you need me. There's people in there. And then all of a sudden the changed. Right? All of a sudden I was in that sort of kind of position. So I'm very interested in that. and. So a lot of these things are things that I want to sort of 
not made, but experienced. And then the whole notion is, then how do I share that experience? And what does that mean to share it, right? Yeah. Um, and although you, you are pretty, when I talk about the pieces, to all this kind of critical thinking, you know, you know maybe perhaps the underpinnings of the work, I don't want to voice that on the view. I want them to sort of arrive to a moment where they are maybe posing <coughs> similar, not exact questions and undergoing um, a, a, a thinking about a subject um, that, um, that uh, is not sort of ideologically foisted onto you. Know, there's, there's no correct way to think about it. Um, but I, I, Thinking about a subject not only intellectually but with experience, with a kind of physical experience. So Leviathan, when it shows, it'll be shown with very particular subwoofers and so forth. And the piece, I think of most of my films as sculptures, kind of phenomenological sort of events. You know, and I think of the person is never seated in in, in, in the theater or watching it. They're actually moving in space and they find themselves either in a room with an image of poppies, and they find themselves with the poppies, or they find themselves in a room, and suddenly they're in a room with a sculpture, and that sculpture is something so truck. And so I am here with this thing. I exist at this time. This thing exists with me. I exist with this thing. And this is a, a different way of thinking about a, merely a, a kind of concept, or even a, um, a, a political proposal or political sort of question, which is always kind of a remote thing, right? Kind of, kind of, kind of remotely thinking about something. So how do, how do you get the uh, intellectual apparatus to work with the phenomenological apparatus? Oh, sorry. Um, I think that the Um, so, continuing on that, um, so does, uh, does it matter to you when we go and look at Phantom Drop that we ever know, or if we never read the didactic panel, or we never, right. does it matter that we know where that truck came from or what that truck represents in the whole experience, like that, uh, of taking it in? Do you want the, the viewer to, to engage with the political possibilities of that piece? In a way, it's it's kind of like what I said about Robert Berry's photograph, right? You know, at the very beginning. Does the question that this may not be what it's proposed to be, does it matter? The proposition that it is what it proposes to be, right, might indeed be important enough that that, even just as a proposition, that is a truth, might actually matter, right? On the other hand, another way to answer that is that when I create the works, I have to, um, in my work, I mean, even though there's almost all of my work has a kind of political underpinning, at least for myself, right? Um, um, they're totally immersed in notions of beautiful, right? And notions of the aesthetic experience. So, one of the things that I try to do is to make sure that that is first most for the view, right, that that experience, right, or image, right, uh, is the first part. In other words, if you can look at this thing as a, uh, maybe perhaps as an abstraction, and actually, um, and, and, uh, and that the piece will still be generous. Right? I, I mean, I thought of that a lot when, in 1991, during um, the broadcasts of Desert Storm, was actually probably the first time we saw um, these images of nothing being broadcast. And you'd have uh, a reporter off on the side explaining to you what you might be looking at. And many of the times during the Desert Storm night vision live events uh, on rooftops, um, there, were no, there weren't any explosions. So you were looking at your television monitor, and it was this kind of dark and then sparkly sort of, we're looking at this kind of monochrome, sort of image, and I was 
kind of fascinated about uh, how uh, politics and media were bringing to us kind of an aesthetic experience that had been so hard, right, at least in America, to promote to the common, to the general public, right? <laughs> right? So I really got I really got interested in that. And I got interested when, when once I was watching that and off on the um the the, uh, the anchor watching it live with you, right? Um, um was uh, Dan Rather. He's talking to the journalist who's probably up there with the cameraman who was shooting me. And uh, then you can see Dan Rather sitting here, and the image was behind him going off, and it was a really cool screen. And Dan Rather said to, I don't know who the term was, was so and so. He said, So and so, that was, you know, where you are, what, you were, what we're looking at, and why you should care. And I just thought, what an inane thing to say at the time. Right? But then I immediately thought, those are perfect questions for art, right? <laughs> what are we looking at and why should we care? <laughs> Which is basically the question, right? Um, if we don't know what we're looking at, you know, is there, can I still kind of make you care or can I still create a situation in which you sort of pull something in? And so I, on the first level with Phantom Truck, it becomes very important to me that, um, that you become the apparatus of imaging. That you had this experience. Like, you know, you walk into a room and it actually the piece reveal itself. Phantom in as a uh, in its Latin roots means a kind of illusion of ghost. But if it's taken back to its original Greek roots, it means to make appear, to make visible. So it's an active thing. And it's an active interactive thing. Right? It's a who is doing the action of making it visible, right? That's a viewer or the the, the other that makes it visible. Right? What is the, the, the verb to phantom? Right? Which is what it would be for it to phantom. The object or phantom. So in Phantom Truck, you become the apparatus. In Nocturne, which is the poppy video, which is apparatus that is locked into this kind of theoretical or ontological debate of what exists or pre exists before. Uh, image or object exists. In this case, that technology or apparatus is out. It's not in the room. You're the apparatus. So your, your physical aspect, you, your eyes, your presence, your ability to stand there, your breathing and whatnot, images that thing. And um, so that becomes kind of an interesting sort of experience. I don't think that, you know, when I told my colleagues and friends that First time I was in Documenta, that I was going to take my work and hide in a dark room with them. I was like crazy, right? Hey, you're a documenter, we're going to hide you, work in a dark room. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm going uh, to do. But I also thought, too, I was really interested in the fact that maybe perhaps we made it into it. Even those of us who weren't. Part of it. We made it. We made it happen. Right? We allowed it to fact. Right? So, and maybe, you know, in a document, I would say, you know, maybe 10% people in 2007 recognized this thing from 2003, you could say what it was that a, a, a large percentage might have gone to a label, just like they would have in a gun shop, a summer rainstorm, you see a little label that says, you know, analog recording of single gun shot, and it would be the Or in Documenta, you could be by rumor. Right? Or sometimes even in the room, right? Or somebody would go in and then leave. And then they would meet up with somebody who's asking them, and they would go, oh, did you see uh, the truck? They wouldn't say, did you see the truck? My name is too hard, too long, so I just see the truck. <laughs> oh, no, I don't see the truck. There's no truck there. Yeah, there's a truck there. No, 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 there's no truck there. Yeah. Oh, there's a truck there. Did you see the truck? So the room 
started about whether the truck actually existed. The reverse started. They had it just like with the church where, you know, we're searching for the aliens and this is taxi drivers who are the ones who are convinced without even knowing that they are taught to exist. Meanwhile, the art going public is listening to the radio to try to find the pirate that they broadcast and they never find it. So where, where that happens is kind of um, elusive and not in, in my hands. I do want to control it enough for it to happen, but then once it happens, I can't, like, like Um, I think, unfortunately, we're probably out of time for this evening, but thank you so much, Nika, for your talk, and thank you, everyone.